Hey, WP Campus. I'm Blake, CEO of EduPack. I'm Nathan, the CTO of EduPack. And I'm Matt, Chief Creative Officer at EduPack. EduPack aims to manage millions of higher ed microsites. Our tool will make WordPress more useful for campus stakeholders, streamlining every institution's approach to website management. We're a community focused initiative. Higher ed professionals like yourselves are working with us to build a platform that benefits the entire higher ed industry. In the spirit of community openness, we wanted to share with you some of the ideas around microsite management that have inspired our work. We'll highlight with interviews from several of the key higher ed pros who are part of our EduPack community. We'll also demo examples of institutions already using EduPack and give you some talking points that you can take to your administrators. So let's get into the big question. How can universities manage huge microsite networks? Matt, over to you for some stats. Thanks, Nath. We wanted to get a better handle on the current landscape, so we surveyed a bunch of higher ed institutions from both the US and the UK. Here's what we found. On average, institutions have 250 sites and 2.5 content management systems with many of the larger institutions managing over 15,000 sites. Added to this, WordPress is gaining market share every year. Currently, over 42.5% of the internet is run on WordPress. And this is reflected in the higher ed space too. In a survey conducted by EduPack, every participant stated that their institution is using WordPress. Universities operate on a huge scale. They have many departments and many staff. And without robust workflows and procedures in place, it's difficult to keep track of all the sites created and owned by those staff. From speaking and working with many higher ed institutions, we understand that there are several key problem areas that EduPack will address. Self-service onboarding, content governance, brand control, archiving policies and accessibility. Without a single flexible system, already stretched resources become ever more difficult to manage. This is perhaps the main reason universities end up managing different technologies. One member of staff procures a site in one technology, whilst another chooses a different technology. Branding falls by the wayside. The institution's image isn't maintained. Official communication is off-brand and user-generated content doesn't follow accessibility or other content policies. So how do universities balance the freedoms that academics demand with a lack of IT resources and the needs for control that marketing staff require to promote a higher ed institution? I spoke to Bill Malashak, one of our Brain Trust members, about how Dartmouth manages their microsite system. Let's have a listen. Hey, Bill. Hi, Blake. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of how Dartmouth uses WordPress with their website network? What we, we do, um, we just did last month was we created uh, about 1,200 new sites for the incoming class. And that makes our um, fourth full class that we've done this for. So now we have, at this point, the entire undergraduate student body has their own website. And we, at this point, plan on continuing that. Um, as part of the onboarding process, students receive emails. They have access to uh, mentors who help them because these portfolios are primarily writing portfolios, which is a required component for an undergraduate program. And there's a whole DART Write department, uh, the Institute of Writing and Rhetoric, that administers this DART Write, DART Write program that assists the students both with their writing and with um, the administration of their own portfolio. Um, so the, uh, the process is, uh, I would say, fairly smooth and uh, well honed at, the, at this point now that we're doing it for the fourth time. I really like the idea of bringing WordPress into improving, into, into the, the work of improving digital literacy because that is what students are being exposed to. They're, yeah. After they just spin up their first site and post a few blogs, they have so much more um, uh, tools and, and understanding of how now over 40% of the internet works. Um, so that is a, that is a huge um, uh, additional learning tool that, that they're doing outside of the classroom, it sounds like, with Dartmouth. 
Um, that's certainly our hope. Uh, I, I'll mention another interesting project that I that I was recently involved in, um, where we typically there's some student interns that are associated with the Hood Museum, which is a, an art gallery that's part of Dartmouth College. Really, a fantastic art gallery, and normally the um, student interns are assigned a um, a gallery that they curate and prepare in the museum that people can visit. But because the museum was closed due to the COVID pandemic, they were given the task of designing a, a website that would be their exhibit. And so they designed these really fantastic websites for, um, for them as part of this project. And what was interesting, these are students that are not really, you know, they're not doing computer science, they're not web designers, um, they're just uh, students that have had their portfolio and were given a free reign for their um, assignments. And, and they really did an amazing job. It was really um, great work. And um, we have showcased those sites in uh, on our main WordPress network to, to um, illustrate what, what students are capable of. How how are how do you see like the higher ed um, web systems future becoming? What where if you if we put on like a future minded hat, what are you most excited about in some of the technology and the uses of website systems in higher ed, um, specifically in the way that Dartmouth is using it, but in the way that you can you kind of see um, uh, web services going? Where 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 what what's the big kind of future prediction that you have with it? Well, I, I don't know that I have any grand predictions, but I'm certainly very excited about the full site editing capability because that's really where people that want to invest in their website hit a, a bit of a wall when they are working with a theme and they can't do certain things that they would like to. So having that capability more embedded throughout, I think will allow people to be more creative, be more flexible, and uh, make their websites more expressive. Um, certainly, the just the addition of the block editor, which we did fairly recently, um, allowed people to have more flexibility with their content. And I think that was a positive step. So I'm hoping that full site editing will be similar and allow um, additional flexibility and creativity. Thanks, Bill. That's really, you know, yeah, I, I, we're, we're right on board with the full site editor as well. And um, thanks for pro providing your feedback as always. And uh, we really hope uh, our project um, and the community we bring uh, furthers what Dartmouth is doing. So thanks a lot for being part of it. You're welcome. My pleasure. All right. Talk to you soon. I think it's awesome to see Dartmouth giving every student a WordPress blog. But when you're managing a site for every new user, like Dartmouth is, a key point to focus on is accessibility. From reading level to content translatability, there are lots of additional items that administrators should be aware of. We recently held a brain trust on accessibility, and there was an excerpt with Michael Mangos of the Tamman Agency that I think really speaks to how institutions should think about accessibility in their microsite networks. Let's roll that tape. Michael, I wonder if you can set the stage for what uh, humans can do with accessibility and, and how accessibility is really a conversation that goes beyond the technology that we consider accessibility tech. Yeah, sure. Like when we talked the other day, um, you know, you're asking like, what, what trends are you seeing or what's sort of interesting happening? And one of the things that came to mind is, as you asked me that question the other day was like, you know, I've been seeing a big shift in our corporate clients. Um, like they're, they're, call them like regular content editors or managers, not people that are responsible for accessibility directly as a primary function, but as like a secondary function in their role, mm -hmm. seeing some awareness shift there, which is really interesting. I think, you know, in higher ed, the people I've met in higher ed in accessibility, even when it's not their core function, seem to understand a lot more about it than like corporate America. So good to all of you, by the way. Um, but I can tell you that like generally, if I took sort of a more broad sample of people working and creating content um, or building websites, um, I've seen the shift over the last two or three years from like, hey, accessibility is about color contrast, right? Which is like, yeah, a tiny piece of it is, sure. But there's like this huge other piece of it. I'm seeing more people coming to the table saying, 
hey, accessibility is about not harming users or, or consumers, right? And and meeting them where they are as opposed to making them meet us where we are, right? And I, I'm it's not universal, but like I'm seeing a lot more people coming with that attitude, which is really exciting because I think that's when we start to say, then how would I leverage technology? Where is technology not going to help me meet, you know, achieve that goal of meeting people where they are, you know, or not harming users? And so you know, I love technology. I mean, I'm a technologist too. We make software. Um, I'm not building AI, maybe like Gavin is, but certainly, you know, we're using tools like that Gavin would be making or, or, or producing. Um, but we're we're really also looking at everything through the lens of of like how do we not harm the people we're trying to actually serve? So that's an interesting kind of shift in in, in attitude. I mean, I would I would like to see that be universal. It's not yet, but it's definitely getting better. As Michael said. Accessibility is more than just the technology used to measure metrics. Think about the users you're trying to reach. What's their reading level? What type of metrics do they care about most? Those are the metrics your accessibility plan should be using to judge the success. Another one of our Brain Trust members, Yi from Yukon, had some good points on how you can use a dedicated accessibility manager to hit the metrics that work best for your institution. Let's have a listen to Yi. So I can share what we've done at UConn. Um, in, initially, the trigger is the lawsuits coming in and stuff. And then uh, we found an uh, uh, IT accessibility coordinator position. So she's uh, focused on uh, um, improving accessibility on campus IT-wise. And uh, um, so it's a joint kind of joint uh, sponsored or funded position from ODI, the uh, Office of uh, mm -hmm. Diversity mm -hmm. and Inclusive. And she works closely, she's on my team mm -hmm. and she works closely uh, with uh, Center for Students with Disabilities uh, office. Uh, so that she reviews uh, and she includes those students to see what tools they use, uh, what technology like screen reader, uh, all kinds of tools that they rely on. Uh, and then on our WordPress environment, we host like it's a multi multi site uh, instance uh, hosting about 2000 sites. Um, and then on the theme wise, we have some accessibility checks to control the uh, color contrast, uh, the font size and stuff, that basic thing and alt tag, if an uh, image is missing alt tag, we'll gray out the image and have an alert telling uh, the webmaster that you need to put in a uh, alt tag. But still need some human eyes to, cause they will just put image one. That's not helpful whatsoever. So it needs to be a meaningful out tag uh, to describe what's included in the uh, uh, image uh, rather than just uh, image one that's um, not helpful to anyone. So uh, raising a lot of awareness on this topic, we have accessibility guideline. Um, we also, um, the coordinator has like uh, web accessibility workshops with webmasters. Um, and we, we see a lot of use cases, uh, PDFs that's not accessible, uh, that people just too easy for them to create a PDF and just post it on the online, which is not accessible at all. So she's having workshops to tell people how to create accessible documents. Uh, having guidelines, having documents there. And she even set up a badging course for any faculty staff who's interested in learning about uh, accessibility and pass the quiz to get a badge so that they can at append in their uh, email signature if they want to, saying they, they pass the course and have accessibility uh, requirement. And uh, uh, of course we control something on the theme, but a lot of content is controlled by the users. So when they make, when they request for an account, we usually give them a draft email address uh, to go by and when they go live, there's a checklist they have to attest to that saying they understand the requirement on accessibility and they, uh, they read about the guideline and what they need to do to comply. 
uh, and then we will then ask, uh, we use Ally for web. It's a utility. I think it's a Blackboard utility because um, we use Blackboard. So uh, we ask the tool to scan um, the, the sites periodically and they will uh, generate uh, reports. And right now we're focusing on higher level like school, college websites uh, instead of like individual faculty websites because um, we don't have capacity to address all the issues, uh, just the bigger ones, um, the schools or uh, units or initiatives um, that's higher in the rank. Uh, whenever a site goes live, we ask Ally for Web to scan. And once we see the score, the report, we will reach out to the webmaster and then have uh, going through the report and trying to see what's the critical thing that or quick or easy low hanging fruit that we can address right away. Um, so that's kind of our effort on this topic. Some really interesting points from you there. We also heard from Blake and from Michael that accessibility needs to be more than just technology. And what strikes me is that there's a need, uh, there's a need for an element of education. I liken it to first aid training giving someone the basics so that they can save someone's life. In this case, when it comes to accessibility, giving, some, giving staff the basics so that they can, they can serve end users better. I really like the idea that EduPAC can empower institutions to be more proactive when it comes to accessibility rather than reactive. One university that stands out in my mind is, is the University of Gloucestershire. Uh, across the pond over here in the UK, accessibility is also a big issue. Uh, and we've been working on a big project with the University of Gloucestershire to, to help them with their accessibility. So much so that they've actually become one of our first pilot universities on EduPAC. And I'm going to hand over to Nathan to tell you a bit more about that. The University of Gloucestershire recently moved their flagship website over to WordPress. Now, they have internal customers from all sides of the university that need support in building a website quickly and to meet the exacting standards demanded by UK law on accessibility. So here's more from Rob Blagden at the University of Gloucestershire. Hey, Rob. Hi, man. <laughs> Hi, Rob. Hi, man. Um, so, Rob, can you start by telling us just a little bit about the University of Gloucestershire? Sure, yeah. So we're uh, a smallish university uh, in Gloucestershire, as you say, uh, just under 9,000 students. Uh, and I guess we pride ourselves on knowing each other, um, being a fairly small team, but being able to react quickly. So people know each other across the university. Um, our students focus on a range of subjects um, from education, media, computing, business and health. Uh, and other schools, I've forgotten. Uh, so a, a range of different schools, really interesting bunch of students. And um, as a university, we've got this slogan that we care because we can care because we're small enough. So we're kind of turning around the uh, being small is actually a positive for us. Uh, it, it means we, we know each other more closely and we can get stuff done more quickly, which is great. Um, what else can I say? So we're, we're across multiple campuses. So we... Um, that's an interesting challenge from a technical perspective for us as teams because we are resourcing uh, teams across lots of different campuses that are uh, many miles apart um, but that makes it more interesting for us all uh, means we've got to make sure our networks and our systems work well uh, and generally that the teams um, all work well together and move between the sites as and when they need to that's great and it kind of leads to our next big question which is what do you see as a benefit for edupack um, in working with gloss yeah great question so we've got a myriad of websites and uh, I, I went and asked the question i knew we had quite a lot um, but when we saw edupack on the horizon I, I put a bit of a call out in the university and said who's got websites who's doing what? what what's happening where and you wouldn't believe the list of websites i got that i didn't even know that existed so trying to get some control of this and know what's where is one of the big benefits, I think, um, along with a whole raft of other benefits that come with this. So if I know what sites I've got, uh, we can make sure we're monitoring them, backing them up, uh, ensuring the data is safe and that we're compliant with uh, GDPR or other relevant laws. Uh, and we can make sure that the accessibility is there, which is becoming a, an increasing requirement across certainly across the UK and I'm sure wider, 
we need our, our websites to work well for any user. And the problem is at the moment, people can go off and create a website tomorrow uh, with a couple of pages, different images or videos or whatever they want to share, but they may not add the correct um, tags to support um, accessible browsers. They may not add their, their alt tags or, or, or put the transcript for your video, et cetera. They may not make the ability to change fonts and colors. And so suddenly we're non-compliant and we're then offering a service corporately that we don't know about that is actually limited in who can access it because we've not addressed some of those issues around accessibility. Um, I'm sure there was a bunch of other issues. Well, one of the ones we found is that users come to us after having run a brilliant project, created some great resources on the internet for people to use. And then they say, but our funding's come to an end. So Rob, we can't lose this resource. It would be a waste of all of that research. Uh, so what are you gonna do about it? And suddenly I'm landed with a website in uh, a layout and a format, uh, a language, a configuration, a database backend that can all be completely different, hard for us to support such a range of things, um, and with no warning usually as well, it's last minute. So that's a real pressure for us that um, Edupack, I think, is going to really help us do. The one last thing uh, I was going to say was something about standardization as well. So if we want the accessibility, we want things backed up, we want a standard approach that we know is supportable, um, Edupack will give us that. And we can even uh, produce sites with branded themes or, or non-branded themes, but that have got a certain theme, if you like, that it, you kind of know it's a, it's a corporate website. Uh, you know the layout, you know how it's going to be easy to navigate for users. Uh, and so that was a big thing as well. And of course, saying let's do that for the whole university ourselves, we'll, we'll go and do it, it's fine, without a tool like Edupack, just becomes really difficult because then we've got to organise our web hosting, we've got to spin up sites as people want them, then we've got to configure all of the DNS and all the, the user settings for that. And, and Edupack is just going to streamline that workflow for us from an IT perspective because we'll have a domain set up for our websites We'll be able to add others where we need them, but we'll be able to, at the click of a button, create a website uh, for a department who requests it within minutes, and then they can start using it. Uh, the way they interact with it is, is simplified compared to normal websites. Um, it's all using WordPress standard stuff. So that does mean uh, through some negotiation, depending where we host it, we can then use uh, whatever you can use in terms of plugins and themes for WordPress, which helps us but it just means we can manage all of that. We can get some visibility. And there are plans to build in that accessibility checker as well, which is groundbreaking for us because suddenly we can have a view of 100 websites uh, in a dashboard that says these three are compliant, but actually they'll all be compliant because WordPress will let us do that. It will help us make sure we know where the data is. It will give us a single contract to manage as well. So we won't have hundreds of different contracts and then we won't have the problem of moving websites around from different contracts. So it gives us a massive degree of control and simplification, but at the same time speeds up the process and gives freedom to our users to produce what they need to do, express themselves the way they need to, but in a safe space. Yep, that's that's really what we're all banking on. Um, Matt, do you have any other questions before we, we let Rob go? No, I think that's everything from me. Well, thanks, Rob, so much. Uh, like I said, you've been a real dream to work with, and uh, we can't wait to continue building Edupack with you all. Yeah, that's too. That's great. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, Rob. We'll talk to you soon. Will Bye. Do. Bye. Bye. We love building features for higher ed pros like Rob. Building features in the open means that Edupack features are available to users who want to use Edupack, not just those who can afford it. To ensure that our features are open as long as possible, we're launching a sponsorship program today. Our first sponsor is Pantheon, and I sat down with John of Pantheon to ask why they're sponsoring Edupack. Let's have a listen. Hello, Blake. Hey, John. So my question for you is, why is Pantheon supporting Edupack? Well, if you heard us talking about our tagline at, at Pantheon, well, I guess right there on my banner, um, we've been talking a lot about this idea of web ops, um, which is the tech is super important, but there's this whole layer of 
needing human interaction. Like it takes a whole team. It's not just developers. Um, it takes a team to really make this happen. And so in this area of governance that you all are working, I think aligns so well. It's like, um, we need to realize that for sites to be successful, it's more than just developers, even though they play a critical role, but it takes designers, content strategists, it takes uh, stakeholders that are leading the way um, and helping manage all of these sites. And I think that's where the big wins are in the future. What gets me excited um, is that we can improve the lives of like everybody in that process, everybody working on the website and involved in it. Um, and giving kind of a path forward. And so I'm hoping that more stuff around this idea of governance can come out and so that we could start to have people processes that align with the tech processes that are being put in place. Um, with like working with teams with lots of different people involved, how do you like, how do you facilitate that? Do you have any kind of tricks of the trade that you've seen folks who work with Pantheon's web ops are like kind of really working on? Do you have like a single control panel? Is it great to like have a lot of in-person trainings? Is there something that you can say, like if you're a big team and you really want to get centralized and bring your kind of web systems together, um, that you should do this. What is the this that you would kind of go to right away? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think like as a team, I mean, it's uh, some of the basics are like communication aspects of like just getting your team talking together and understanding what each other does. Um, I think like it's easy to be quick to jump to a tool whenever there's like people p processes that could be there. Um, Pantheon wants to be a part of that. When we, we talk about like how can we surface this information, make it easier. Um, one of the processes that helps in that so you've got some some communication layer but the next piece is like lowering the barrier of entry um and so you want to make sure people aren't stuck um and being like this is too technical for me so how can you make that easier for people um and so we're working to make tooling around that we're doing some uh new feature stuff around a, a launch of our autopilot to make it easier to roll out wordpress updates as they come out um but also you know that's what EDU Pack is doing is you're making it easier for people to manage their sites. Like you could do some of what EDU Pack does really like as a developer, very clunk like clunkily, um, very technical, deep version. But by making that able to be done through a plugin, you suddenly make it so that more people um, have the ability to do that, which again lines with that WordPress mission of democratizing publishing. Like let's give more people more power. Exactly. Exactly. And I will have to say, because you use that catchphrase, that Pantheon is definitely giving EduPack the power to give more people more power. Uh, so thank you so much for being our first major sponsor. Um, and hopefully you're not the last because we really want to keep EduPack going and growing and, and being as open as possible and keeping as many features as open as possible. So John, I just want to say thank you to you uh, for being a great proponent and, and thanks to, uh, to your entire team at Pantheon. Um, I hope to see you soon, very soon. As John said, open source projects like EduPack push the entire open web forward. But open source projects need to be rooted in a solid vision and Nathan, our CTO, is going to introduce EduPack's vision before we head into our final demo. Thanks for listening. Let's wrap up on this. We know the pains that you go through day in and day out because we have them too. A microsite should not cost an average of $15,000 or take massive amounts of IT resources to maintain. EduPack automates website governance. In just a few clicks, administrators can filter stale sites, ensure users are using the proper branding, and really hone their accessibility requirements. These features have been built with, with higher ed professionals like you in mind, and we're going to fine tune WordPress for the needs of educational establishments. And on that, let's check out what we're doing with EduPack. EduPack brings WordPress to higher ed. Our first release includes two MVP features, self-service onboarding and site templates. Site templates make sites reusable in an easy to navigate onboarding form. 
A campus user selects what template they want, adds key details, tunes boilerplate content, then publishes their site. Beyond our MVP, we're excited about a few features that are currently in development. Brand Control sets branding standards across large networks of sites. An EduPack pattern library maintains accessibility and design standards of content blocks. Our Integrations dashboard offers a curated list of plugins and third-party features vetted by higher ed pros. Visit edupack.dev to learn more about our project. Together, we can tune WordPress for higher ed.